Hello and a warm welcome to our latest edition of Echo at Africa here from Lagos. My name is Neota Igbe. Hello everybody and welcome to this edition of Eco at Africa. And indeed, I'm coming to you from Nairobi, Kenya. This is what we have coming up on the show for you today. Why Norway is powering ahead in Europe's electric car market. Why national parks in Ivory Coast are under threat. And why a dark fertile soil is helping to protect the environment in Burkina Faso. We set out in South Africa. The fashion and textile industry are a major cause of pollution in our world. They have a huge carbon footprint for one. The most widely used synthetic fibers are made from petroleum. So our eco hero this week, Tracy Gilmore, looked at how she could reduce the amount of clothings that end up in the trash. The result was a clothing bank in Durban. Sustainability is a core of the business and it helps to generate income for other women too. It's morning rush hour here in Durban. Many people take mini buses to work, those who have work that is. The unemployment rate in South Africa is more than 20%. Norsisa Kakani has already secured herself a spot on the sidewalk for her roadside shop. They never go wrong with hills. Most of the people like hills because they said when they are going to church, they must wear hills. She sells things that big retail chains have discarded as unsellable. That's how the 33-year-old makes her living now. I, I was poor. I can say that I was poor, uh, but now I, I'm not. I'm not poor, because you see the I, last uh, before I, I go to clothing, but I couldn't wear it like this. I couldn't do my hair because the little man that I got, I have to buy something to eat. This is the clothing bank where Nosise Kakani buys the garments, shoes, and accessories she sells. The chains deliver loads and loads of stuff here every day. The women who work at the clothing bank have to sort it all and sometimes do repairs. Tracy Gilmore and two friends came up with the idea of reselling good quality rejects that would otherwise end up in the trash. My partner Tracy Chambers and myself have got different passions and my passion has always been to work with mothers, with women. And hers is very much around educating. So we put our two ideas together and Tracy had worked at Woolworths as an executive at the Woolworths, for Woolworths, which is a big retailer in South Africa. And she realized how much waste there was in the retail supply chain. And we decided to try and use this waste as the tool to teach unemployed women how to run businesses. Because we don't believe you can learn to run a business in a classroom. The clothing bank is a social enterprise, so it doesn't yield profits for an outsider. Tracy Gilmore invested her own money to set it up and got some corporate funding. The business is going well now. It is a logistical challenge to process the large volumes of incoming goods. We get in so many, uh, such a huge variety of products, so it's difficult to price them, and they come in in various stages of repair. So sometimes they're easy to mend and sometimes they have to actually be sent off to be recycled. Some of the monies the business generates go towards training the women who work at the clothes bank. Yes. They learn to use computers, how to run a business, how to determine what goods can be reused or repurposed. They might be inspired and able to set up their own businesses, as did Nosisa Kakani. She buys clothes in bulk from the clothing bank at a modest price and retails them for a little more. This one is too short for her. <laughs> I must help my customer to choose something nice for her. This one is too short. No, Sisa Kakani says it is hard work. You can't be a businesswoman if you want, you like to, to rest a lot and sleep a lot. Because <laughs> sometimes I even uh, sleep at 2 o'clock and wake up at 5, sewing the bags. Like, you see this one? 
the zip was damaged, so I had to take out the take out the original zip and then put the new one and then sew it again here. Because when I, when I, when I bought this bag, when I uh, the zip was not running like this. And you don't have to be rich to find something nice at Nosisa Kakani's shop. Let's talk about electric cars now. It's a technology that's yet to make a breakthrough in Africa and research here is still in its infancy. But in Europe, it's a different story. That's right. Norway is the global leader for electromobility. Nearly half of all cars there are electric or hybrid, but that's not enough for the Norwegian Electric Vehicle Association. It wants to expand the network of charging stations, even in remote regions. Let's take a look. Maybe some African countries can learn a lesson. Norwegian Christopher Nikolaisen is planning a trip from Oslo to southern France with his family. He's going to drive there in an electric car, a distance of nearly 2,500 kilometers. Realistically, uh, the car will, will go uh, 350 or 400 per charge. So Christopher will have to recharge the battery six times during the journey. But that doesn't worry him. His computer shows him where charging stations are located along the route. Usually, he charges up the car in his own garage. He says that's what's made electric vehicles so popular in Norway. Not exactly to be um, env environmentally friendly. That was not the first option. It was more uh, the convenience of uh, going into the garage and having uh, uh, a car ready to go and a full tank, uh, to put it that way. Christopher picks up his youngest child from school. His car is a Tesla. He didn't have to pay import duties because electric vehicles are exempt in Norway. That makes them relatively affordable here. That's my wife. Hey. In another electric car. The couple have had eight Hello. electric cars so far. Uh, there are plenty oh, of advantages to owning one. Okay. Whenever there's congestion, for example, they can bypass traffic using the bus lane, one of the many privileges reserved for electric vehicles. Christopher says the system works well. I would like them to keep it as long as possible because that's uh, part of the success. Oslo also has special parking places for electric cars, which don't cost anything and are equipped with charging stations. The electric vehicle lobby has achieved a lot. Norway is probably the only country in the world where we have uh, past the early mover stage, the, the, the early market. Uh, we are about to, to sort of bridge that gap to, to, and, and we are about to enter the, the, the mass market. And that are, there are some challenges with that because uh, we are the only country in the world where, the, where this is happening right now. The Norwegian government is even contemplating a ban on conventional cars. But first, it wants to ensure that even people in rural locations have good access to charging stations. The government is needed and government policy is needed. We believe the financial incentives are important, but also the uh, initiatives we're taking for uh, expanding uh, charging facilities throughout the country. By this year, we'll have a full uh, national network of charging facilities on all main roads. The electricity is cheap and environmentally friendly hydroelectric power, sometimes at no extra cost. Unlike in many other European countries, hydropower is available here in many places. Christopher Nikolaisen needs just a half an hour to charge up at quick charging stations. Then the battery is almost full. Usually there are uniform standards, so he can charge his car anywhere in Norway or abroad. But if necessary, he can also use an adapter. Half the new cars registered in the country already run on electric power. Norwegians are pulling ahead, showing the rest of the world how it's done. 